I feel like Sam stole my thunder. I don't know that you need to stay for my talk anymore. <laughs> so many people have a very strong belief that math is a skill that you are born with or not. I think of it as the myth of the math brain. So it's either an inherent part of our body and you can do math and this is wonderful, or you just learn enough to balance your checkbook and you're done. <laughs> and I stand before you as living proof that this is not true. As was mentioned, I'm a statistician, right? It's what I do for a living. And not only did I struggle with math, as was just mentioned, I was in remedial math. And not just any remedial math. I was so far behind my peers that my school did not have the resources to support my learning. So two, three times a week, instead of going to gym, I went to the math truck. It was an RV that the back had been retrofitted to be a classroom instead of a room. And a woman here in the Philadelphia area would drive around to the local schools who needed the support and help kids like me build up their skills. And I will say, my parents, the school, they were great. They never called us remedial. They never even called us level one. They gave us colors. We were the blue group, or the red group, or the green group. And so we had no idea what level we were. And me, being the child that I was, was convinced that I went to the math truck because I was better than everybody else at math. <laughs> And I did not realize the fact that this was not the case until I graduated college. <laughs> it, it was the end, right? They do the, they, like they do here, there's the, the food and the drink and everything to really bring people together and you have a chance to meet your kids' supervisors and all the teachers can tell the kids how much we're gonna miss them. And so my mother is chatting with my undergraduate supervisor and saying, oh, we're so glad to see Leslie really overcame her difficulties in learning when she was a child. And I said, what are you talking about, Mom? She goes, you were in remedial math and reading. And I go, no, I wasn't. <laughs> she goes, yeah, yeah, sorry, honey, you were. I hate to break it to you. Right? And that's what I found out. So how did I go from that? Right? A student whose school could not give her the teaching she needed to someone who now teaches other students statistics and researches statistics. For me, I can point to the exact moment it was a class, in fact, my senior year of undergraduate, where I had been actually a natural resources major. So for me, that meant wildlife biology and management. And I chose this major because I loved wildlife, I really loved science, and I really didn't like math. <laughs> and it seemed like the perfect fit. And so an elective I took my senior year was called Wildlife Population Assessment. And I got really excited. I was like, okay, wildlife populations. I'm gonna go out into the woods and we're gonna see herds of deer. We're gonna somehow measure and observe wolf packs or snakes. This is gonna be fabulous. And we get into class the first day. We're all seated. The teacher walks in. He puts a big white X on the chalkboard, points to it and goes, this is as close as we're getting to a warm and fuzzy all semester. And I lost it. I thought this was hysterical. About half the class was terrified and did not come back the next day. And I was like, yes, I like this man's sense of humor. I want to know where this goes. And that's what hooked me. He managed to show us the connection between all of these required classes that we had to do. I had been required to take multiple calculus classes, multiple statistics classes, as part of a degree in wildlife biology and management. And I was like, well, I'm supposed to be a well-rounded individual. That's what this is. Right? I get an education, I study math, I study reading, I do some policy, but I care about the wildlife, the rest is just window dressing. And here was someone who said no. Right? If you wanna do what you wanna do, you have to be able to work across the disciplines. None of these things we have you do are just because we can make you, it's because it's gonna help you. And so what did I learn about assessment? And so now we'll bring it into some of my own work. So one of the things that I do is work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to help them predict how many bald and golden eagles are going to die as a result of colliding with operating wind turbines. And this is a problem. We value wildlife, eagles in particular. We also value renewable energy. So we need to find a way to help them coexist. And so one of the ways the Fish and Wildlife Service does this 
is say, we have a policy. Our policy is that we manage these populations so that we have stable or growing equal populations in the United States. And yes, we may lose some to wind farms, but as long as we're meeting those criteria, we're doing okay. It seems straightforward. What's it mean to be a stable population? Eagle numbers last year, eagle numbers this year are the same. What's a growing population? Eagle numbers this year are greater than last year. But how do we know how many eagles there are? You say, okay, you can count them. And sure, I can count things. I can count the people in this room, but I'm probably gonna miss someone, right? They might step out of the room to take a phone call, so I'm not quite gonna get the numbers right. I'm a statistician, there's always some error. I'm gonna start in the front row and go one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, and we have errors. And that's with all of you here in an enclosed space, not really moving. Now imagine if I'm trying to count every single eagle in the United States. We can't do it. We certainly can't do it every year. So, but what we can do is count some of them. So biologists who are trained go up in small aircraft at flying at low heights, and these aircraft take what are known as plant, plant paths, known as transects, and they look out the windows, and they count how many eagles do I see? How many eagle nests do I see? Community scientists, people who like birds, go out as part of planned programs every year to the same locations at the same time, and record not only the birds they see, but the ones they hear. And I can use these partial counts to get estimates of how many there are. So that I can say, all right, I know how many we saw. I know how hard we looked. I know how good some of our observers were. I know the area that we covered. And using all this information, I can apply statistical models to get an estimate. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the models themselves. I recognize that why I might love that sort of thing. It is not a detail that works well, necessarily, in talks set up like this one but it's what I can do. And then I can give that information to my colleagues at the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they can make decisions about how best to manage our country's natural resources. And this is only one type of assessment, right? Okay, we can count animals, that's really important, but we also want to know other sorts of, intel, in, uh, other sorts of ecological insights. We want to know about behavior. We want to know about responses to the world around us. And so some of the work that I also do is with the US Navy, studying how marine mammals respond to naval sonar. And this has been fascinating. My experience has been that people really want to conserve the world around them. So how do we mitigate it, right? It happens at our government level, it happens at our local level. And if you thought that measuring eagles was hard, we're talking about species, some of which can literally dive to 3,000 leagues under the sea. Right? So yes, we can go out on a boat and see them at the surface, but they spend most of their time underneath the water where we can't see them. We can't see them feed. We can't see them mate. We can barely see them move. And yet we want to know how many there are. Have they recovered from the whaling that used to occur? And we want to know if their behavior is changing in response to our human actions. And so here, again, biologists have collaborated with other scientists, with engineers, with software developers, to build what we think of as, we call tags. So it's very much like the smartwatches or the phones that many of us have that record our location, how many steps we take, where we are on a map, but we develop them for animals. So with animals that are on land, we sometimes tag them, and we can do it with some of the animals at, at the ocean as well which is literally kind of like a cow tag, if you've ever seen it, where it's in the ear to let you know who they are and where they uh, belong. If you ever do hunting, right, you deer tag to again let the hunting people know that you legally caught that. With birds, we can attach bands that let us know if we've seen them before, help us estimate abundance and survival. With marine mammals, if it's one that comes out onto the beach, we can actually capture it and glue a tag to its head, and it's rather like it's wearing a little electronic hat. If it's a whale, we're not capturing those. They are a little too big. So instead, people have developed suction cup tags that you can attach to the back of a whale. And then when it dives away from us, the tag can record information such as where it's going, how fast it's going, 
what, how deep it went, the sounds the whale is making, the sounds the whale is hearing. Some of the more advanced tanks can even get pitch and roll. And so we can learn all of this information that we would never be able to see with our own eyes. And some of that information is, I hear sound made by people, what does the animal do? Does it leave the area? Does it stay? Does it stop foraging? Does it run away? Does the behavior change if it hears the sound halfway through when it's eating? Does it just stop and go, oh, now I'm done and leave? We can learn this from the information we get from those. And that doesn't necessarily need a statistician. So what part of that involves me? We can tag tens, twenties, thirties of these animals. We certainly can't tag an entire population. So how do we go from looking at a handful of individuals to be able to estimate how an entire population might respond to something like naval exercises? That's statistics. I will also add, if you want to know the power of statistics and mathematics, I have never taken a single marine biology class in my entire life. And I study bottlenose dolphins and elephant seals and killer whales and blue whales and North Atlantic right whales and gray whales and I feel like I'm missing oh, humpback whales, right? Things that people spend their entire lives being like, I want to study this. I have a friend actually who went through undergrad with me. I was like, how do you do this? This is what I want to do my career and then you just walked into it. Well, I walked into it because I do math, right? It's a skill that is needed and is necessary as part of, of the field. And we've learned a lot from it. In my own work, working with one of my PhD students, we've learned that part of the reason, a very strong driver of the decline in North Atlantic right whales, which are a species of whale that actually swims along the east coast of the United States, that decline is caused in a large part due to entanglement in fishing gear that lowers their survival and keeps the females from reproducing. We've learned that there are, in fact, ways to change how we operate wind facilities, to reduce bat fatalities, so that we can help protect and conserve not only endangered species, but other species of bats that we may value. And this is just some of the work that I've done. Right? There's many, many people like me out there. I went to a conference once where we heard this really great plenary speech, and I wish I could remember their name, but I'm gonna steal their story. And they described it as, many of you often feel disheartened. You do all this work, you learn all of these things, and it seems like it barely makes a difference. And it's like looking at your hand and seeing five grains of sand. And that's all you can see, and it's not very exciting. But if we take a moment to look up, then we realize that every scientist around us has made their own five grains or more, and suddenly we've got a beach, and that beach is really beautiful. Right? And it's that group of people working together that has enabled us to learn what we need to learn. The other thing that you may have noticed from my stories is one, I use the royal we, except for what I pointed out, and then I do tend to say I, but also that they all involve multiple people. I work with biologists. I work with policymakers. I work with engineers and software developers, technicians. All of these people are necessary. And to do that work, I need to be able to speak that language too. I need to be able to speak to the biologists. I have an understanding of biology. I need an understanding of policy making. I need to have an understanding of foreign languages so that I can work with scientists from around the world. I need to know ethics, to know if what I'm doing is a fair thing. I need to understand philosophy in terms of how I design my studies. I need that broad education, because if all I was trained in was in statistics, one, I certainly wouldn't be up here talking to you, or if I was, you'd all be asleep, but I also wouldn't be able to talk to that many people. Now, I can't be an expert in all of those things. Right? It's not possible for one person to do all of that. And so it is the collaboration. It is the working across disciplines and that willingness to build those bridges and not see the world around us in categories that really leads to good science. So I'll leave you with this. What is the equation for better understanding of ecological systems? It's that the sum is greater 
than its parts. And that if we want to understand the world, we've got to do it together. Thank you very much.